In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Here we deal with the plan to betray Jesus. Then one of the twelve, the one named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests, and he would be a Sadducee, and said, What will you give me to betray him to you? He was the one all worried about money before, giving it to the poor. But we can see here he wants money all for himself. That's his lust pattern as an unbeliever. He's a thief, and he loves money. So he said, What will you give me to betray him to you? So they set out 30 silver coins for him. All of this is found in the Old Testament Scripture, as well as the fact that our Lord would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Then in 26.16, from that time on, Judas looked for an opportunity to betray him. And that's what Judas was. He was an opportunist. Uh, he was a user. He latched on to the Lord's ministry as an unbeliever uh, just to use the Lord. He thought the Lord was somebody who was going to go somewhere. And why not? I mean, here's an unbeliever looking at this guy. He's uh, performing miracle after miracle. After a while, he had probably thought to himself, well, this man's going to make something of himself. Well, we'll start charging 30 bucks a miracle, and I'll get in on that, and we'll have a great deal going. And uh, me and Benny Hinn will be rich. <laughs> and that's what, that's what, that was his thinking, that he would uh, uh, go on. But then when he saw things going sour, and he saw that uh, all the religious people didn't like our Lord, and were rejecting our Lord, then he said, well, I've got, an I've got another opportunity. He's still an important man. He's just not liked. I thought he would be a liked man. But he turned out not to be a liked man. And I latched on to this, and I've been with this man for so long, and I'm not rich yet. It's about time I got something out of this, so I'm going to betray him. And that was his thinking. So from that time on, Jesus, Judas looked for an opportunity to betray him. Then we move on to the Passover, 26.17. Now on the first day, that would be Tuesday. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know about unleavened bread, don't we? We use it in communion. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? The Passover was very important uh, to the Jews, but they really didn't understand it. And they didn't understand the Passover meant that uh, they had faith alone in Christ alone. Therefore, all of their sins were judged, and uh, judgment would pass over them. And, and instead, our Lord would be judged. But they didn't understand it, but they went through the ritual anyway. Then in 26.18, he said, Go into the city to an unknown man. He'll be carrying a pitcher of water on his head. And tell him, the Master says, My time is near. I will observe the Passover with my disciples at your house. So our Lord, of course, having deity as well and being filled with the God, the Holy Spirit, knew that there would be a man willing to, for them uh, to have Passover at his place. So the disciples did as Jesus had instructed them and prepared the Passover. When it was Tuesday evening... He reclined at the table with the twelve. And this reclining has to do with the Roman custom of eating. They didn't eat as we do. 
and we eat, we have our uh, right hand on the table, and our left hand should be in our lap. And of course, we don't always follow that, especially with the chicken and pizza. But uh, uh, your left hand should be in your lap, and your right hand should be here, and you should eat like this. They didn't eat like that. Uh, they had a, a type of a long table, uh, kind of like this one, except lower, and you would recline on it sideways like this and eat like that and just recline and then a very relaxed position and uh, eating was a time of relaxation. So he reclined at the table with the twelve and while they were eating the Passover meal he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. 26.22, they became deeply grieved and all began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And that they all went around, Surely not I, surely not I, etc. And then um, he answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the sauce bowl with me will betray me. Now I've seen some uh, uh, scenes of this on uh, television where they've shown... Uh, Judas Iscariot dipping in there at the same time, and, and they make that sound, you know, he just, uh, oh, I've been caught. They all were dipping with the Lord. He, he didn't really specify which. Uh, Peter dipped out of it, John dipped out of it, and so had uh, Judas Iscariot, so he really hadn't pointed out who was going to betray as of yet. But uh, one of them will, and that was his point. The Son of Man will go, that is, to the cross. The Son of Man will go as it is written. It, that's written in the Old Testament that he'll go to the cross about him. And that's something else because uh, the Roman custom of uh, crucifixion it was fairly new. And yet in the Old Testament, they talked about the cross before even crucifixion was used as a practice of execution. And so, uh, it was written in the Old Testament prophecies about him going to the cross. But, whoa, now this is where there is no doubt whatsoever that Judas Iscariot is an unbeliever. There's no way around it. There's no way around it in the Greek or anywhere else. Judas Iscariot is an unbeliever, and he's in hell today. The Son of Man will go as it, as it is written about him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him if he had not been born. The only way that it's better for any of us not to be born is if we're never born again. If we're never born again, we're going to hell, and it would be better that we were never born. So Judas Iscariot's in hell. If uh, it would, if Judas Iscariot had believed, now I'm not saying just because he betrayed Christ he could not have believed. That's not the point. He could have believed at some point and then betrayed Christ and uh, receive uh, temporal punish punishment for it and then go to heaven. But this statement here makes it clear that uh, he's he's better off not being born meaning he's not born again. He's in hell. He was an unbeliever. Then Judas, who would betray him, said, and here's another indication that shows he's definitely an unbeliever. Then Judas, who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi! Not Lord. Peter calls him Lord, John calls him Lord, all the other disciples call him Lord, even the some of the Roman centurions call him Lord, uh, the women call him Lord, and here's Judas Iscariot, and after being with him for so long, he's still calling him Rabbi. He will not recognize his deity. He will not recognize him as the Son of God. Will not. Jesus said unto him, You've said it yourself. Very eloquent way to say, yep, say it yourself. Very, very eloquent way to say, yes, you will betray me. And a very eloquent way to say, you're going to hell. And not because uh, he betrayed Christ, but because he never believed in Christ. And we know he never believed in Christ by the word rabbi, because we know in the Bible, and the only way anyone calls Jesus Christ Lord is by the Holy Spirit. And he never called Jesus Christ Lord. He wasn't saved. 
Not possible. It, it, it's not possible by the fact it says it would be better for him if he had not been born. No, po- if, it, if it's better that you're not born, that means your destiny is hell. If it's better that you're born, your destiny is heaven, and that is because you will be born again upon faith alone in Christ alone. So Judas Iscariot was an unbeliever and the one who betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we move to the Eucharist in 26.26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, and this thanks was an indication of a new meal, a new age. It's an indication of a new age. We're moving into a new age, the church age. And this is where we receive some of the commandments regarding our own communion service held every uh, second Sunday of the month when I don't forget. So while they were eating, Jesus took bread. See, I should remember. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And we all know what this means. It was his body that was uh, going to go to the cross, and that is uh, the indication there. And then in 26, 27, And after taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. And that is the judgment of all the sins of all the world being poured out on Jesus Christ and judged. That's why we follow communion, and that's why we eat of the unleavened bread, which is an indication of his body going to the cross. And then we drink of the cup, which is an indication of Jesus Christ receiving the sins, our sins, the sins of the whole world, including Judas Iscariot's sins, on the cross and judged. 26.28 For this represents the covenant of my blood that is poured out on behalf of many because the forgiveness because of the forgiveness of sins. And that's the only way we have the forgiveness of sins is because Jesus Christ was judged on the cross. And if we believe in Christ, we are forgiven of all post- or pre-salvation sins, and we are saved. Post-salvation sins, of course, are dealt with by 1 John 1.9. Do you need me to go over what? Okay. 26.29 I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's an indication that uh, it's his last meal. He's not going to drink uh, that, uh, that uh, grape juice of the vine. He is going to drink a little wine on the cross, we'll note. The first part he spits out. The first part is a narcotic that they give him on the cross. It's a mixture of wine and something else that would have made him uh, in a stupor, almost like what they would give you before surgery. And that was the Roman uh, way of having mercy on him, but he spit it out. He wanted to have a clear mind and therefore, uh, while he uh, bore the sins of the world, so he rejected uh, painkillers, really. He rejected it uh, on the cross uh, so that he could have a clear mind while uh, he was being judged for the sins of the world. I tell you, from now on I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. 2630, after singing a hymn, and this hymn is Psalm 118, they went out of the Mount of Olives. And now we move on to the prediction of Peter's denial. And we know Peter's the loudmouth. He's been a bit silent lately. But uh, uh, Jesus Christ is about to bring out something that Peter's going to do. 2631, then, then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, and that is in Zechariah 13.7, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That means that the disciples did not have enough doctrine to stick with our Lord. As soon as a little pressure came, boom, they're scattered. Peter would be scattered too. Oh, he's all emotional, and he's 
He's like a lot of people, emotional for the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm going all the way for the Lord. And very emotional. But when the chips are down, there's no doctrine, so he falls apart. So you can be as emotional as you want to be, but when the chips are down and when life gets tough, you fall apart and you do not use your spiritual life just as Peter is going to fall all apart and he doesn't even see it. But after I am raised, I will walk ahead of you. And from the Greek, this actually means, I will walk ahead of you, dragging you by your feet. What it means is, uh, they're way behind on doctrine. And after he is raised, he's going to walk ahead of them. And then they're going to receive at that point the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That occurs on the day of Pentecost. And then uh, it's as if our Lord's dragging their feet, trying to pull them up to snuff. But only then will it occur because finally they'll have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, all of which we need to learn the Word of God, all of which they needed. That's why it took them so long. They didn't, they didn't ask for the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, when Jesus Christ said, Look, you could just ask for the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and I'd give it to you right now. Or, or the Father in Heaven would give it to you right now. And they just ho-hummed, and nobody asked. And so they went along, duh, 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 and they were pretty stupid about doctrine. And then finally, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is forced on them, poof, and they have it. And then, from then on, it's as if our Lord's dragging, their, uh, dragging them by their feet to get them back up to where they need to be doctrinally. But after I am raised, I will walk ahead of you into Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all, now he's getting very self-righteous right now. He's very emotional for the Lord. And he, he's sincere. He's very sincere when he says this. And he has no thoughts of ever, ever denying Christ. And he says, though all fall away because of you. In other words, I'm better than everybody else. Yeah, they, they, they'll all fall away. Yeah, I, I looked at John over there. He's a sissy. He'll fall away. They'll all fall away because of you. I will never fall away. It really upset him that our Lord said this. Then Jesus uh, said to him, I tell you the truth. On this night, on this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now, the Romans loved chickens, and uh, the chicken, by the way, was an unclean animal to the Jew. The Jew could not eat chicken. And so, the Jews actually detested chickens. And probably when they heard him ba ba in the morning, they just uh, covered their ears and gross. They were just grossed out by the chickens because uh, they thought of them as unclean, just like the pig. And so, and so our Lord uh, uses the rooster and says, The rooster, the unclean animal, uh, it's going to crow, and then uh, you will deny me three times. Then Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. He got very self-righteous and said, I'll die with you, Lord. I'll go with you all the way. I'll even hop up on the cross with you if I have to. No way I'm going to deny you. <laughs> now, arguing with the Lord. Arguing with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you can see how stupid Peter is. Now, we don't see Mary of Bethany arguing with the Lord. She knows he's going to the cross. And so the Lord looks at Peter and says, You're going to deny me three times. And uh, Peter should have took note of it, but instead he started arguing. No, nah, I'm not going to do that. Everybody else will do that, not me. And then everybody else said, "No, nah, none of us will do that, Lord. We'll all go to we'll all go to the cross with you." Is that was the consensus uh, by the time uh, the end of the evening, by the time the end of the conversation uh, came up. And that brings us to the fact that uh, Peter will deny Christ three times. He will do it, and. Uh, a lot of people don't believe in eternal security, but this is one passage that uh, cinches it right up. Peter right now is in heaven, and he denied Christ three times. And uh, he had eternal security. And even while uh, Peter was denying Christ, Jesus Christ loved Peter. And even while Peter was denying Christ, 
uh, 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 Peter was saved and was going to heaven. Remember, he had already been given the keys. Remember, we studied that the key, the gatekeeper, and all of that, and we studied what it meant. And it doesn't mean that he'll be standing there. It just means that while he was on earth, he was given evangelism, and he could evangelize, and that's the keys to uh, heaven. Evangel, and if you evangelize somebody and they uh, believe in Christ, that's the key, and they believe and they go to heaven. And so when you die and go to heaven, you're not going to see Peter first. You're going to see Jesus Christ first. You'll be face to face with the Lord in the blink of an eye when you die. And uh, you may see Peter later, but you're going to see the Lord first. Who would want to see Peter first? You know, if that were the case, I'd, I'd laugh as I walked up to him. <laughs> I remember that time. And, uh, and, and, you know. But, no, I'm just joking about that. But we have the fact of eternal security. Eternal security. And this is something that uh, we will review. And there are certain rationales that pertain to it. First of all, we have the virtue of God rationale for eternal security. We'll cover it. We've covered it before, but we'll cover it again. There's nothing wrong ever with repetition, and we need to get it cemented in our mind that we are eternally secure, and no matter what we do, whether we deny Christ three times, ten times, twenty times, if we have believed in Him, we're saved, and we're going to heaven. So first of all, we have the virtue of God rationale. And that says that God himself cannot cancel the 40 things that he, or the 39 irrevocable absolutes that he gives us at the moment of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. God himself can't do it. It's outside of his character. He can't do it. All of this is an issue of integrity. And it would be a violation of, integ of his integrity. Eternal life is part of the 39 irre irrevocable things. It is imputed to us at salvation, and God the Holy Spirit regenerates us. What is regeneration? To be born again. And can you be unborn, by the way? No. We're all born. We die, but we can never be unborn. And when we are born again, we can never be unborn again. We have eternal life. There's no way that can ever be taken from us. And when God gives, He does not take away. God cannot and will not cancel eternal life. This does not imply, however, that you can just, uh, well, that you will all succeed as believers. And it does not imply that you can just say uh, goodbye. Well, you can, but you'll be punished in time. Say goodbye, God. I know I'll see you in eternity and then go out and raise hell and uh, make a fool of yourself. Well, you'll be punished for that, and uh, you'll have a lot of temporal punishment, and then when you go to heaven, you won't have any eternal rewards. But you'll be in heaven, and you're saved, and it would be outside the character of God not to save you, because Jesus Christ did it all on the cross, all of which we should be very familiar with. The fact that we are imputed with plus R. This is the, uh, the virtue of God rationale. What, do, what is part of God's virtue? Plus R, plus righteousness, perfect righteousness. And that's imputed to us when we believe in Jesus Christ. And that's found all the way back in the Old Testament. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. When we believe in the Lord, it's credited to our account for righteousness. What is the credit? That we simply believed in the Lord, we receive righteousness. So we have the righteousness of God, and therefore, uh, the, if we have the, God has righteousness, if we have His righteousness, He cannot deny His own righteousness. He cannot deny His own righteousness. It all has to do with virtue and character. Romans chapter 5, 1 through 3. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that has to do with reconciliation. Therefore, having been, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our access by means of faith into this grace in which we stand. Consequently, and this is the corrected translation of Romans 5, 1 through 3. And this last part is... Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful translation given from my pastor. Consequently, let us have esprit de corps, 
Let us have esprit de corps because of confidence in the glory of God. And that simply means that uh, we know that we're saved. And uh, let us let us have that, uh, it's a, a military term, let us have that esprit de corps. Let us all know that we're saved. Let us have that confidence. In the military, they have an esprit de corps that they're going to win. Have an esprit de corps of confidence that you're saved. Have that confidence. So, our relationship with God, therefore, does not depend upon our integrity. That would be outside of the framework of the virtue of God. If it depended on our integrity, we can never have plus R, no matter how hard we work for it. And no matter how hard, no matter what we do, no matter how good we are, no matter what type of behavior change we make, no matter uh, what type of clothing we wear, nothing can uh, bring us to plus R. Only Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, is a substitute for us, and whose sins, and who, in which our sins were poured out on Him and judged. If we believe in Christ, we have plus R. Therefore, that's the concept of the integrity of God rationale, or the virtue of God rationale. And there's exegetical rationale as well. Exegetical has to do with exegesis from the Greek. And the Greek language makes it very clear, especially in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The exegetical rationale for eternal security. We had the integrity of God or virtue of God rationale. Now we have the exegetical rationale for eternal security. Ex exegetical meaning exegeted from the Greek language, which is the original language of the New Testament Scripture. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved. This is actually the corrected translation. You can get it from even the way they get it in English. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's pretty clear in itself. But when you take it exeget exegetically from the Greek, uh, we actually get this translation. For by grace you have been saved in the past, with the result that you stand saved forever through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And that is how it comes out from the Greek, using the, uh, the uh, well, what we have here, I'll just go ahead and give it to you. We have the Greek perfect paraphrastic. I don't know if you want to write this down or not. Uh, maybe you'll want to look it up later on your own. There are some internet sites, by the way, where you, there, there's actually a, a seminary in California where they're teaching uh, the Greek. And a lot of it is theme-influenced, but they're doing very well in teaching the Greek. And you can take the online course, and I've looked at it. And uh, they're dealing with basic stuff like this. Uh, and this is basic, uh, the basic part of the Greek language. And... So we have the Greek perfect paraphrastic in Ephesians 2.8 composed of two verbs. We have the verb sozo, S-O-Z-O, and the present active in indicative of eimi, or eimi, E-I-M-I, S-O-Z-O, and then we have E-I-M-I. Now, this is carried over from the Attic Greek. This is not Classical Greek. This is Attic Greek. And in the Bible, there are eight different Greek languages. It's not all Classical. And a lot of people who go through seminary learn just the, the Classical Greek because that's all they can do. And then when they get to certain passages, they use rules of class, actually Koine. They use rules of the Koine Greek and they don't apply if uh, somebody's writing in Homeric or if somebody's writing in Classical. And there's eight different kinds of Greek languages. My pastor learned all of them. He's a genius. I'm not. I'll never know all eight, but I'll just take his word for it. So we have Sozo and Iami. And uh, the paraphras paraphrasis is carried over from the Attic Greek. And it indicates that the writer cannot get all the details into one verbal form. Therefore, he uses two verbal forms by using two verbs. 
And you understand when you write an English sentence, it usually is, has a subject, a verb, and a noun. And this uh, Greek, in the Greek here, we have two verbs: sozo, s-o-z-o, and also imi. Two verbs. And there's a reason for it. And it's because it's making a forceful expression of eternal security of the believer. That's the only reason. Two verbs in one sentence. Why? To make it forceful. And this is how it comes out. For by grace you have been saved in the past, the first verb, with the result that you stand saved forever through faith. There's the second verb. Uh, and this salvation is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. And there are two verbs in one sentence. An odd thing. But it's something of emphasis that comes out in the Greek. And that means eternal security, period, over and out. You can't lose your salvation. And actually, uh, this paraphrasis, that's what it's called. If you want to know how to spell it and uh, look it up on the internet or however, it's P-E-R-I-P-H-R-A-S-I-S. It is one of the most powerful and forceful of all Greek expressions. And it is the most forceful and powerful expression in any language. No language has come up with something like this. That's why the original language of the Bible is Greek. That's why God the Holy Spirit in eternity past, uh, well, God the Father decided it and God the Holy Spirit executed it in eternity past, that the Bible would be the original language of the New Testament where the mystery doctrines are. That would be Greek. And it's because it is a deep language. It is, it is very... Uh, it's very deep. They have words that uh, it, it takes a, one word in the in, one, in the Greek language might take two, three paragraphs in the English language just to describe. Just like we have metanoieo, change of mind, and metamelamai, to feel sorry and uh, to feel sorry and have a change of mind, and then two different uh, two different uh, words. Yet, uh, in the English, they always say, repent, 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 repent. Except in the NIV, in one place, uh, one of the writers uh, got the gist of it and said, oh yeah, metanoia, oh, change of mind. And so the Greek, uh, the exegetical approach, is rationality, uh, for the eternal security, and all of that, if that, that is, a, uh, none of us know Greek, so we'll move on from that and move to the positional sanctification rationale of eternal security. The positional sanctification rationale. And when we believe in Christ, we are put into position with Christ. And we see that in Romans 8, 38 through 39. I have confidence that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And the love of God is what? It's unfailing. It never changes, right? We get that from the Psalms. It's unchanging, unfailing. And therefore, no matter what we do or how we screw up, God loves us. He knew what we were going to do in eternity past. He knew how we were going to screw up in eternity past. And uh, He still loved us, and He still sent Jesus Christ to the cross, knowing what wretched beings every single one of us are. So this can, uh, you can also use the uh, baptism of the Spirit rationale, and uh, the, the fact that when uh, you believe in Christ, you're baptized with God the Holy Spirit, puts us in position or into union with Christ, and that is for every church-age believer, and so we have positional sanctification. Also, Jesus Christ is eternal life. Being in union with Him means we share His life. That's found in 1 John 5, 11 through 12. This is the record. 1 John 5, 11 through 12. You can write down the verses and look them up later and then write them out for yourself. 
I'm going to go through it quickly because I don't have too much time, and I, it's a, it kind of like a review, so I don't want to uh, slow down on it. This is the record. God has given to us eternal life. Eternal. We know the English language, and we know that eternal means eternal. So if we have eternal life, it's something that can't be taken away. It's eternal. Eternal life, and this life is in His Son. That's Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. That is eternal life. And he who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. Who has the Son? Everyone who's believed in Christ, of course. We share in Jesus Christ. Uh, we share Jesus Christ's divine righteousness. That's found in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21. We are accepted in Christ forever, Ephesians 1, 6. We share the destiny of Christ, Ephesians 1, five, And this deals with the fact that when we believe in Christ, we share all of these things. Again, Ephesians 1.5, Ephesians 1.6, and 2 Corinthians 5.21. We share His divine righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5.21. We are accepted as Christ. We are accepted in Christ forever, Ephesians 1.6. We share the destiny of Christ, Ephesians 1.5. We share the heirship of Christ, Ephesians 1.4. We share the election of Christ. And we are sanctified in Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.2 and also 1.30. Then we have the logical approach. That was the positional sanctification rationale. Now we simply have a logical approach. And we remember a fortiori and all of those things. Romans 8.31 Therefore, to what conclusion are we forced? If God is for us, who is against us? The moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you know that God is for you because He's given you 39 irrevocable things plus one, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That one is revocable because we have an old sin nature. And when we sin, we grieve or quench God the Holy Spirit. And if we never rebound, we don't have a spiritual life, although we are saved. The moment you believed, you know that God was for you. And this is given in Romans 8:31. And if you don't believe in Christ, or actually, if you do not believe in eternal security, you're acting as if you're against yourself. You're against God's for you, and yet uh, you think you can lose your salvation. And God's for you, and so you're you're uh, battling against yourself. You're out of fellowship, and you're still saved, and you're going through a lot of guilt and all that. Romans eight thirty two. He, God the Father, who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up over to judgment on behalf of us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? So once we believe in Christ, how shall He not freely give us all things? And uh, since He'll freely give us all things, then uh, we're going to keep our salvation, of course, and He's going to give us a lot more on top of that once we believe in Christ. And so at uh, one second, at the one seventieth of a second, you believe in Christ, you receive salvation, and God gives you many, many things. And this system of logic that comes out of these verses is called a fortiori, a fortiori, meaning a stronger reason from the Latin. And we've studied this, and a fortiori says this: If God did the greatest thing for you. If God did the greatest thing at salvation by not sparing His own Son, it follows logically that He can do no less than the greater thereafter. And that is to give you eternal security. It's just logical. Once again, a fortiori says, if God did the greatest thing at salvation by not sparing His own Son... It follows logically that he can do less that he can do less than the greater thereafter. What is less than the greater? Eternal security. The fact that God keeps you uh, eternally secure is less than the greater. The greater was Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying as a substitute for our sins. We study the agony of all that, and for us to think we can lose our salvation is to insult the work of Christ. It's to say, He didn't do enough. 
while he was screaming out over and over again, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And he did do enough. And we can't lose it. He gave it to us. It's free. And that's the a fortiori. Then we have the family of God rationale. And remember, we're getting this all from the fact that Peter denies Christ three times. And I've gotten into arguments with people before I shouldn't have uh, because they were stupid and ignorant and wouldn't listen anyway. And uh, they would talk about, well, uh, well, uh, you believed in Christ, okay. Well, what if you deny Christ? And I said, well, Peter denied Christ three times and he's in heaven today. And then it just uh, confuses them and they just go off and they want to argue and they don't care to listen to what the Word of God has to say. And that's the difference between positive and negative volition. And that's all that has to do with. So, we have the family of... Of God rationale. The family of God rationale. And when you're born into a family, you're born into a family, period. And when you believe in Christ, you're born into the family of God. Uh, born again, as it says. And in Galatians 3.26, it says, For all of you are the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus, period. By faith in Christ Jesus, we're all the sons of God. And Jesus Christ will not deny his sons. We even have a, a parable, the prodigal son. We have the prodigal son, and it talks about the fact that uh, uh, even though people go astray from the spiritual life, they still have a salvation. Because once we're born into a human family, we can't be unborn. And once we're born into the family of God, we can't be unborn out of the family of God. And more than that, believers in the church age are royal family of God. We're royalty. And you know, the uh, Prince William, what it, Prince Andrew too, what are the two handsome uh, young men in England? Henry. William and Henry. Those ladies know that real quick, don't they? Who? <laughs> Harry. Harry? Prince Harry. Well, uh, some, sometimes they don't act right. Sometimes they get in trouble. But uh, they're still royal family, aren't they? You ladies don't care how they act as long as they look good, but uh, sometimes they act goofy and put on Nazi uniforms and have a big parties and do all types of stupid stuff. Royal family doing that over there in England. Well, they're still royal family. They're not kicked out. And uh, they might not act like royalty, and they might bring embarrassment on the old queen there. What's her name? The Queen Elizabeth II, that old hag. And uh, she might bring some uh, uh, embarrassment to her, although she seems to be pretty gracious with the children. I don't keep up with it too much. It bores me. But uh, either way, they're royalty. And we're royalty. And no matter how we act, uh, we might go out of fellowship. We might get uh, pissed off for about five days straight and never rebound. And, uh, well, that's not acting like royalty, and you're not under the royal honor code. For a moment today, I was not under the royal honor code because when I got home, my cat was mad. I had been gone for a week, and the cats are different than dogs. Dogs get happy when you come back. Cats, well, at least mine. Maybe it's a psychotic cat. I don't know. But it got it. It was mad, and we both walked in the door. And she she went to bed, and I walked in the door to do some study. And uh, the cat meow 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 meow. So finally, I let it out, and maybe it would stop uh, doing that. And so I got up to uh, go to the refrigerator, and it just jumped and latched onto my leg and bit me hard. <laughs> And I, I lost my relaxed mental attitude. And I won't tell you what I told that cat. <laughs> but it was terrified when I got done with it. But it was, uh, I didn't beat it, but uh, why do they get mad? It's just mad. Anyway, it, it, probably I'll go back and it'll attack me again. I'm almost scared to go back. The thing, I mean, it's. did you hear it? It just, rawr, rawr, crazy. But he's part of my family, and he's going to stay anyway, even though he acted crazy. But that's the royal, that's the uh, family of God 
rationale. We have the body metaphor, of course, for eternal security, and that is that Christ is the head, and therefore every member of uh, the body of Christ, all of us who have believed, uh, we uh, well, if we act stupid, he's not going to cut off his toe. We're part of the body of Christ. Let's say I'm the toe and I cut out the cat. Jesus Christ isn't going to cut off my cut me off out of the family because I got angry. No, uh, we're all part of the body of Christ, and uh, He's not going to cut you out of His own body. We're in His body, and that's the body metaphor. And he, uh, if uh, Jesus Christ got uh, uh, upset every time somebody sinned, then the only thing there would be is a head, Him and there would be no one in the body. We're all sinners, see? And so the, the, that's a pretty good rationale there. And that's the body metaphor. You can find that in 1 Corinthians twelve twenty one. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. The head cannot say to the feet, the head, Jesus Christ, cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. So even though we act a fool... Uh, he can't uh, cut us off from his own body. We're in the body of Christ. And then we have the essence of God rationale, and then we have a lot of verses that we can go over tomorrow. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us uh, to the fact that uh, we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And may we come to realize your grace, and may we come to see your grace and how you deal with uh, uh, Peter and how you deal with others in the Bible. And may we understand that all of us can grow in grace and in knowledge and come to a point of maturity in which we can receive accolades just like Mary of Bethany who received the accolade that she received. And so when we uh, go to heaven, may we not be ashamed at the uh, resurrection, but may we hear that glorious phrase, Well done, my good and faithful servant. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.